thank you all for joining us at the beginning of tonight's lecture. Uh, my name is Mark Costa, and I am the Managing Director of the Trumansburg Conservatory of Fine Arts, located in Trumansburg, New York. Um, and tonight is the very first in our series of lectures on the intersection of fine arts and science. Um, tonight, I am pleased to introduce um, Kirsten Kurtz, who is Cornell University soil scientist and internationally recognized soil painter and manager of the Cornell Soil Health Lab. Before we get to this evening's lecture, I would like to take a moment to thank all the generous donors of the Trumansburg Conservatory, our wonderful board of directors, Tompkins County Tourism and NISCA, New York State Council for the Arts, and most especially for our friend Marcia M. Shavely for suggesting that we reach out to Kirsten uh, for this lecture series. Thank you all very much for helping to make this happen. I'm very, very pleased to have Kirsten join us this evening. Hello there. And I'm going to step back and take care of the chat and um, letting everybody into the meeting. meeting. So at this point, if you would be so kind as to mute your ends, and I will turn over the presentation to Kirsten. Kirsten, thank you so much tonight. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to share my screen here. And we're gonna go. All right, I hope everyone can see that. Uh, welcome, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kirsten Kurtz. I am a soil scientist at Cornell University. Um, as part of that role, I manage the Cornell Soil Health Laboratory. And I'm also an artist. Um, I have a bachelor's of fine art and I'm primarily known for my work painting with soil. Um, I've also included uh, some information about my website here, which is soilpainting.com. And that's part of my soil painting initiative which is where I'm endeavoring to expand knowledge of soil through my art. Yeah. And I've also put up on the screen my Instagram, if anyone is interested in kind of the week by week things that I'm working on and my email. All right, and I think I'm gonna mute a couple people here. All right. And then we're going to get going. All right, so I want to start by talking about soil a little bit. Um, for the most part today, I'm going to be talking about my art and I'm going to be talking about my techniques and my motivation, things along those lines. But I really want to start with a little bit of background in what soil is. So soil is alive. Now that's not exactly true, but it's a living system. And it really um, is useful to think about it as being alive. And that life of the soil is mostly made up of microbes, bacteria, and fungi. So many of you may have heard, but in case you haven't, there are more organisms in a teaspoon of soil than there are people on the planet. So this is just a phenomenally, um, diverse and active system that's happening under our feet. I will add one caveat, which is that you would find that amount of uh, living organisms in a healthy soil and not so much in an unhealthy soil. These microbes, bacteria, and fungi have a lot of really important services that they provide within the soil, including that they decompose soil organic matter. As part of this decomposition of this soil organic matter, they also increase nutrient availability and storage. We also know that a healthy soil will help to protect plants against pathogens. And we know that a healthy soil and a soil that has a lot of um, soil microbial activity is going to have an increased uh, aggregation and pore space. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, a kind of famous relationship with um, this soil microbial food web and plants is called mycorrhizae. And this is a symbiotic relationship between fungi and roots of various plants that actually increase nutrient uptake and carbon sequestration, 
I'm sure many of you have heard about carbon sequestration. I will touch on that a little bit today, um, but this is very, very important for many reasons. All right, so I want to talk for a second about what a soil aggregate is. Um, you can see in this picture on the screen, these sort of little clods of soil. Those are called soil aggregates. And you really see those in healthy soil systems typically. But it's interesting because when you think about what soil actually is, it's only about 50% solid material. So we consider soil something that would be two millimeters or smaller. And out of that, about 45% is gonna be made up of rocks and minerals. The other almost half is water and air and other gases. And the way that these work is that they, um, that water and that air is kind of around the aggregates that are made up of those rocks and minerals and organic matter in various amounts. 5% is kind of an average for a, a healthy farm field. And that's why we sort of picked this number for this slide. But what's really important about this is that that life of the soil really lives in the aggregates and around the aggregates in that space. And that space is incredibly, incredibly important for soil health. So soil is an endangered natural resource. Um, this is something that we can't just count on to be here for even necessarily you know, our children's lives. This is something that has to be cared for and managed properly. So 95% of our food comes from soil. And I'm often asked about hydroponics and other things along those lines, if that would be a potential uh, replacement um, for our soil. The short answer is no. You really have to just think about how much many grains you personally eat. You know, think about wheat and corn and soy. Those kinds of things can't be grown in a greenhouse or in a hydroponic setting. So it's really, really important that we have this soil for our food sources. Although of course, soil provides many other system services beyond just our food. Um, soil also stores a phenomenal amount of carbon, right? This is really important. We've been hearing a lot about CO2. We've been hearing a lot about too much carbon in our atmosphere in the form of CO2. And soil is this amazing, amazing sink for that carbon. Soil actually stores more carbon than the atmosphere and plant life combined. This is a phenomenal amount of carbon. But of that carbon, we've lost 50 to 70% of our soil carbon stock since the advent of industrial agriculture. This is a lot of our soil carbon being released into the atmosphere. And along with that, we've lost about a third of our world's soils mostly to degradation, um, over tilling. It could be from being paved over heavy metals. There's all sorts of ways that soil can erode and become degraded. Um, and that this is really what drives me and drives my work. Now, I didn't mention earlier, but I'm also a graduate student. Um, in addition to my responsibilities managing the Cornell Soil Health Lab. So I'm a graduate student at Cornell in the Department of Natural Resources. And I just wanted to share one slide from my research, a totally visual slide to just show you guys what I'm talking about here. So you can see on the right hand side of the screen, um, a, this is a, a soil sample taken to 12 inches down. And I think that you'll be able to see there those really nicely formed aggregates, those beautiful crumbs of soil. And this sample was actually taken from a remnant prairie. They're extremely rare. One then, uh, sorry, less than 1% of these remain undisturbed in the United States. And this is an area that has never been cultivated and it's never been um, tilled, right? And that's the really big factor here. So this soil represents what soil was like before the beginning of industrial agriculture. On the left-hand side, you can see an example from a farm. This soil sample I took um, about 300 yards from the other sample, something like that. It's directly adjacent. It's the same soil type. It's the same slope. Many 
different factors. The only difference between these soils is that the one on the left has been intensively tilled. It hasn't had crop rotations. It hasn't had any of these like sustainable practices. It's just hammering at it year after year, corn, 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 and this is what the soil will look like after that. It's worth noting that this soil on the left actually had extremely high yields for what they were growing. This soil in Nebraska in the tall grass prairie where I took these samples is so fertile that you can continue to farm it without having any type of sustainable management. But when we looked at these and when we brought them into the lab, we were able to see and to actually put numbers on, which will be in my paper coming out the next year or so, um, how much we've actually degraded this soil just with modern ag. And then I also wanted to include this middle picture. Um, this is a picture of actually where I took the samples. On the left is the cornfield and on the right is the remnant prairie. And if you look at the horizon, I think you'll see that the remnant prairie is actually physically higher than the soil in the ag side. Like that you can see it from that distance. This is some really significant um, degradation. But while I'm talking about managing for soil health, and I know that this is depressing and it's hard to hear in certain ways, I want to tell you guys that we really know how to improve soil. We know how to manage for this. And it's really not that complicated. I was able to distill the basic concepts of farming for soil health into six um, basic ideas. One would be increasing your organic matter. There's a lot of ways you can do that. You can integrate cover crops, you can um, mulch, you can integrate um, compost. There's a lot of different ways you can build up that organic matter. You also wanna think about cover crops. And in general, you should always have cover on your field. Any soil, the most vulnerable it will ever be is when it's bare and being tilled that is the most likely time for you to lose that topsoil. So having that cover and with modern technology, we're able to plant these cover crops right into a cornfield as you can see in this picture. And I love this concept of feeding the underground herd, right? Because I said, we have this phenomenally large system underground and they mostly are eating um, carbonaceous materials, various things, you know, and we have to continue to feed them. If we just take from them, will end up with nothing. Um, it's also super important in soil as it is in life to increase diversity, especially rotational diversity in the field, having patterns, even doing mob grazing, which is following your crops with um, animals afterwards. That's become very popular. It's a great way to build up soil health. And it's extremely important to control traffic. You don't wanna drive on a wet, field, that's when you compact your soil and you start to end up with soil like that one we just saw, that ag soil, without any pore space between those aggregates. And in general, reducing tillage. So it really is just these things. I had to do a little plug for um, improving soil health because that is my other great passion after art. But with that, into the art. All right, so a couple years ago, I was invited to um, come speak at the Soil Science Society of America meeting in Texas. Um, and when they sent me the email, they referred to me as an artist turned scientist. And I like this idea, um, but when I thought about it, I really felt that I was more a scientist turned artist. And it's because although I've considered myself an artist since I was a child, and have always created art, I really felt this need to contribute to society. And when I discovered soil and soil health in my lab, I knew that I had found my home and where I could really communicate from. But then interestingly enough, being in the lab and seeing these like crazy beautiful colors come into the lab, I just started saving the soil and I didn't even know why but I was just like, I felt that there was some reason that I would want some of these really cool colors. And it was within the Cornell Soil Health Lab that I really actually started to embrace my creativity again. Um, when I joined the lab, the website was super old fashioned. We didn't have a brand. We didn't really have like a 
um, sort of a common thread across our various platforms, things like that. So um, one of the first things that I did is that I worked on establishing the, the brand, part of which was co-designing our logo, which you can see here in the middle of the screen. Um, I co-designed this with Jen Thomas Murphy, who works at Cornell University. Um, and then we also revamped the website. I did that with Craig Kramer, another colleague at Cornell University. You're gonna hear me talk about collaborations a lot today. Um, and I also instituted a social media campaign. So these days, lots of labs have social media campaigns. It's not really that big of a deal, but seven, eight years ago, when I kind of started getting this going, no one was really doing anything like that for soils anyway, or at least not to my knowledge. Um, and then of course, I just made sure that that vibe kind of continued through everything, including our uh, publications and our book, which I have here on the screen. So while I was working in the lab, I was um, asked to participate in a World Soil Day event at Cornell University. World Soil Day is in the beginning of December every year. And we had a little celebration and we brought out some kind of little demos to show people cool stuff with soil. And at that same time, I was taking this class, um, learning acrylic painting with this woman, Kim Schrag, who lives in Trumansburg. She's an amazing, amazing artist. Some of you are probably familiar with her work. And I was studying with her and I was really not liking the colors of um, the paint at all. I felt like it looked like plastic. I found it to be really garish. So I asked her if it would be all right for me to try to make my own paints from soil. She said that she thought that was a cool idea. Go for it. And um, I did this. This is my first um, series. I call it the Family Portrait Series. And I did these uh, with Kim Schrag. And this is where I started to learn my techniques and where I developed my recipe for making soil paint, which I'm going to talk about later today. Um, I think you'll see as we move through my various paintings today that I've learned a lot since then. It's tricky to paint with soil, as you might imagine. Um, it's very textured, so it's definitely taken me some time to learn how to manipulate it as it's now become my chosen um, art form. So a professor saw these paintings, I brought a couple to the World Soil Day, and he asked me if I would um, run, organize a World Soil Day event with public soil painting for World Soil Day 2015. I liked that idea. I went ahead and did that. Um, I drew this based off of the golden ratio, that kind of spiral from shells and such that can be found all throughout nature and in science. I thought that was appropriate. And I did this painting of um, the skyline of Cornell with a soil profile underneath. And a soil profile is kind of how the layers of soil um, lay up underneath the surface. So we did this, and along with this, we made a time-lapse video of the event. There was this painting, um, was done by a bunch of people, I would say about 60 people passed by and helped us with this painting. And then we also had a blank painting, um, a blank canvas where anyone could kind of be creative and paint whatever they wanted. And I wasn't worried about them messing it up, right? So we did this, we created this video, um, a time-lapse video of the event, and then that video ended up getting seen by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, and they actually uh, based an international soil painting contest directly on the work that we did at Cornell, right down to the time-lapse video and the community um, impact and interactions and such. So when I heard that they based the contest on the work that I had been doing at Cornell, I went and bought soilpainting.com. I had an idea that I was probably onto something around then. And of course, we entered into the contest. I recruited, uh, coincidentally, other women um, scientists slash artists. And we painted um, this painting, Three Sisters in Soil Together, which you can see here on the screen. Um, we did win the contest for the university category. 
that was a huge honor. And it really was where I started to feel myself making an international impact, which is really important to me. Um, and you can see that this painting, as well as many of my paintings, are quite large. Um, this painting, this is us getting it photographed at Cornell University. They have this really high quality camera that we use up there. And it just gives you an idea, a bit of the scale. All right, so with this, I knew that I kind of wanted to, to stick with this, even though I was super busy with grad school and the lab, this makes me so happy. I knew I had to, to continue. So the next event that I did was for the Science Cabaret. This is in Ithaca. They do really cool work. Um, they're also one of the first people who sort of were excited about what I was doing. So that was really cool. And basically what we did for this is I did a lecture with the director of the lab, my colleague, Bob Schindelbeck. And um, for the first half, I lectured about sort of the origin of soil colors, which I'll touch on a little bit today. Um, and how soil paints were used in paintings throughout history, which I'm not going to talk about today, and some things along those lines. And then the second half of the talk, he talked about soil health, and I finished this painting you see on the screen live. Um, it went really well. Their logo, the Science Cabaret logo, is the martini glass. So I kind of did this as a little shout out to them and then ended up gifting it to one of the, the women who organized the show. I also teach soil painting um, a little bit more formally. This picture is taken at the Johnson Museum. I've done a bit of work with the Johnson Museum. I have a really good relationship with them, I think, um, and I really respect what they're doing. So they organized this painting after night event for the um, undergrads mostly, but there were a couple of grad students there. <clears throat> and it was really cool because it started around 7 p.m. And then we painted till like 11 or midnight. I don't remember, quite late for me. And then we had to actually like kick the kids out and tell them to go home because they were having so much fun, which was just really inspiring to see these young students want to paint with soil, right? Instead of like go out and do things with their friends or what have you. And then also the thing that makes it the most fun for me is that invariably people tell me what they know about soil. And I just love hearing people, you know, I heard one student telling another student how that was iron in the soil, making it red and all these things. It's just, it's really cool. And it's also an example of the way that I teach soil science when I'm doing these events, which is quite casually. I don't really try to lecture. I don't try to run the conversation. I just sort of answer questions and casually talk about soil, you know helping people to see how cool it is, right? Not how complicated it is, because it's complicated, but it's more cool than complicated, in my opinion. I also teach uh, soil painting quite formally at Cornell University in the Art of Horticulture class. Um, I believe I've done this three years. I can't remember if I've done it two or three years in a row, but it's really fun. Um, the Art of Horticulture class is an example of what I love about Cornell because it's just such a mishmash, right? It's like all these different types of students, not usually art students, not usually ag students, or hort even necessarily students coming together to learn about horticulture, to learn about art, and they pretty much make all of their art with things you can find in nature. They do a lot of dyeing, a lot of kind of sculpture-y things, super cool. And I go and um, just kind of make all the paint for them, give them blank canvases and away they go, right? So it's just really fun for me to see what other people do with this um, material, with this paint that I make. And I just get a lot of inspiration and energy from teaching and, and from seeing people get excited about learning new things. But I don't want to be just communicating to the ivy, ivory tower, right? And nothing against the ivory tower, but I really, really, it's super important to me to communicate with my community and to communicate really with everyone as much as I can. And one of the ways that I found to do that is by doing these events at music festivals. So this picture is from the Trumansburg um, Grassroots Festival that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. And this was 2018. Um, and you can actually see the painting right behind me. We, I recruited a handful of other artists. 
So this design was done by Phoebe Acido, one of my best friends in the world, for the Grassroots Festival. And then I was able to actually talk her into helping to paint the soil painting live, which was really cool. And then I recruited two of the women who did Three Sisters in Soil to help with this, one of which is Patty here in the front with the purple hair. And then she with the pink um, headband kind of right behind me, they both were involved in the Three Sisters in Soil. And then I also met this other gentleman, young man really maybe, from um, Columbia named Alexander Falls, who also paints with soil, and he has connections with up here in Naples, New York. So I invited him to paint with me as well. And um, it was really fun. We got a lot of really good interactions. And this is the, the final result of that painting. And then also on this screen, I have this Finger Lakes Bounty. This is a painting that I did um, live at the Ithaca Reggae Fest. So I also do this at the Reggae Fest. Um, and this is kind of a small painting compared to most of my paintings because I wanted to be able to just paint it myself live. Um, and yeah, it was interesting. This is where I started to really mess around with this black soil. This is muck soil. Um, it's very, very high in organic matter. Uh, they usually use it to grow onions, all sorts of things. There's muck soil in New York. It's extremely good soil and it has that beautiful black texture and it paints so nicely. It goes on extremely smooth, extremely dark. It's a great, it's a great material for me. All right, and then this is the next year at the Ithaca Reggae Fest. Um, I recruited this woman, Julie Rosa. She's an awesome artist. Um, she's based in Ithaca. She's an oil painter. She does a lot of stuff with like portraiture and flowers and things like that. Super, super talented. One of the best artists around here in my opinion. And she, I think was just kind of, we're buddies. And then she was curious about painting with soil. So she agreed to do this with me, which was really fun. So her and I painted this thing live at Reggae Fest. And it's, it was step, it's a good time, you know, all sorts of people come and stop by. And then of course we have our, our blank canvas so that the many, many little unattended kids can paint like crazy and not mess anything up and they just love it, it's super fun. And one of the most important things that we do, in my opinion, with these events is that we make videos. So these videos were all made by Craig Kramer, my close collaborator. He's a communication expert at Cornell. Um, and he's helped to produce these videos. And then of course, we can outreach to way farther audiences, right, with these videos. Plus, it's really fun to see a soil, especially a really big soil painting um, done live you know, with a time-lapse video. So it takes two minutes to watch four hours worth of work and you can kind of get an idea of all the people I really talk to when I'm doing these events. So all of this has kind of, I guess I don't know exactly how to put it, except for to say bluntly, it's garnered quite a bit of media attention. And what makes me really happy about that is that because it's a lot of work to work with the media, I don't know, some of you might have experience with it, but it really, it really is a lot of work, um, but it's extremely worth it. And almost all of these people who reached out to me, reached out to me about my art. They heard there's this woman, this young scientist painting with soil, we wanna interview you about that, right? But then I'm able to also talk about soil health. I'm also able to talk about it being this essential natural resource that, in my opinion, belongs to us all and needs to be cared for and talked about and thought about the ways that we think about clean water and clean air. I want clean soil or healthy soil to be a household name also. And it's cool because this has like some major reach, you know, like definitely probably the most significant was being featured in John Deere magazine. Um, they have multi-million reach and it's global, um, also being featured by Yale Climate Connection. That was a huge honor on the radio. Some of my friends and Hector heard me on NPR, you know, you're like, oh, it was pretty exciting. And then even like some international stuff, right? Like I've been in a Swedish magazine about ag and I was recently, which I thought was really cool in this magazine called Young Researchers out of Turkey, where they're basically getting kids excited about being scientists when they grow up. So that was super fun. And it's just, 
kind of nice to have this evidence that it is actually getting out there. You know, like I have no idea how that woman in Turkey found me, but she did, right? And of course I was happy to oblige. But by far my most significant um, outreach and media coverage came from meeting this woman you see on the screen, Summer Rain Oaks. She is an eco supermodel. So what that means is she only models for eco-conscious companies. Um, she's also a plant expert. She actually went to Cornell and got her undergrad in plant sciences, which is a very good department. And she is what they call an influencer, right? But a really awesome one, in my opinion. And she's out there mostly talking about houseplants. She's really a houseplant expert. So um, she helps to run this community garden in Brooklyn. And she asked if it'd be all right to come up and to interview me about the results of her soil test um, for one of her blogs on her YouTube channel. I said, sure, no problem, you know. And then she came up and we got talking and she ended up seeing what I was doing with my soil art. And she ended up making two separate documentaries, one about um, my art and one about what I do in the lab. And these have been seen by you know, tens of thousands of people. It's crazy. We sent it to some, um, well, the Art of Soil was on the Earth Day's virtual celebration this year. And I don't really have a way to, to estimate my reach, honestly. Um, but I know that it's gotten out there and all over the world. And it was, it's really cool. She's a really cool person. And again, it's about collaboration, right? So I just, I have to stop kind of and plug how important it is to work with other people. I wouldn't be able to do any of these things if it wasn't for having a team that I work with at Cornell, but also having friends being kind of a friendly person and wanting to collaborate with other people to get this message across. And I really recommend that, especially for young up and coming people. It's like, you gotta collaborate, you know, and you have to make sure that you give back to them what you get from them. It's very important. All right, well, I wanna talk a little bit about how I make soil paint. So I take two millimeter sift soil, um, which you can see here in this pan on the screen, and I mix it with gesso, which is derived from gypsum, and water. And from that, I'm able to make my own soil paint. And you can see here on the screen, I think some examples of some of the soil paints that I've done. Um, or the colors that I've been able to achieve rather. And then I just wanted to briefly touch on the origin of these colors, right? So most of the colors in soil comes from chemical reactions um, or from the chemicals that are in the soil. So typically we'll see red or yellow, that's gonna be an iron. White is typically silica, lime, chalk. That dark black soil, that's usually organic matter. A brown soil that you might um, kind of think of when you think about soil, that's actually um, usually a mix of organic matter and iron oxides. And then we can get purples from purple sandstone. I don't have any, I would love some. Um, I've only heard about it. And we also can find blues and greens, both in the oxidation and reduction of iron oxide in the soil, as well as through clay. So I actually buy my green clay from France and from Russia, of all places. And then I wanted to show you guys what it looks like to build up these paintings. Um, so most of my paintings have about eight layers of soil. Each layer has to dry completely before I can put another layer on. Um, so you can kind of see moving from the left to the right just how kind of crappy it looks in the beginning until you really build up those layers. So it really takes a lot of patience. It's hard. I've almost given up on so many paintings, but I've learned that with patience, I can build it up to get the look that I'm actually going for. This painting is called After Artemis. Artemis was a goddess from mythology who was usually represented by a deer. Um, she's very closely associated with forests. Um, and with fertility. And I kind of thought that she would be the name and also this image was an appropriate way to talk about the potential degradation of soil that we have going on on our planet. This is one of my very earliest soil paintings. Um, and 
it's a little bit more depressing than most of them that I do, but I am, uh, I do like this painting. This hangs in our lab actually, right above uh, one of the computers in our lab. This is another um, painting that I did as a commission. This was done for a professor um, at Cornell and he had a very specific um, idea in mind for this painting down to the colors. He really wanted those sepia tones and it needed to be um, his view out of his um, window. So this was a fun project. It was kind of the most constricted I've ever been within a piece, strangely enough. As you see the next ones, you might kind of question that, but it was just the colors and the various things. But it was a good challenge for me and I'm very happy with how it turned out. This was also a commission for a local landscaping company. I'm friends um, with the owner and he asked me if I'd be willing to paint his logo in soil. And I was really thrilled to do it because what's a better thing for a landscaping company than soil, right? Um, so this is nice. And it's also an example of those nice greens that I can get with that clay that I buy. This was an interesting one. This was a commission from a gentleman in Pennsylvania for his church. So he is um, a Moravian, which I had never heard of before. They seem like very nice people. Um, and this is their logo for their church. Um, their it's called the Moravian Seal. Um, and what was really fun about this is that he had special soil he wanted me to include in this painting, right? So he brought me soil from the church property. It's a very old church in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. It very means a lot to them. And then he also brought this beautiful black muck soil that I did all this detail work with. And it was really especially cool because he brought me like five gallons of the muck soil, like a full on bucket of it. So I have muck soil for the rest of my life. And honestly, it's a very hard type of soil to find. So it was quite the score. And this is hanging in their church. Um, this is another uh, commission, if you will, that I did for a friend of mine who is an artist. Um, hands down, the best thing about being an artist, in my opinion, is that you get to trade with other artists, right? So this guy is a metal worker and he made me this really epic um, sculpture of a raven. And in exchange, I painted this portrait of his dog who is named Nora. And he really loves this painting. I like it too. I never got like a perfect photograph of it. So I had him send me this pic um, just a couple days ago. This one I painted originally like three years ago, probably, or two years or something like that. But then I just came in recently um, over the lockdown and added the detail work and kind of lined it out just because I wanted it to pop a little bit more. And I do like it a lot more with the line work. Um, and this is thinking about Audubon, right? So you guys all know Audubon. I'm sure, you know, he went and he really documented through art um, the birds of North America. I love his museum. Um, I've been there. I'm a big fan of Audubon. And again, with this, this after Audubon, it's a bit of a play on words. It's a reference, direct reference to some of his works, but it's also thinking about, you know, the birds, right? And us losing that if we don't move to a more sustainable um, mindset in general. You know, we need to keep this diversity. We need as many birds as possible, just like everything else. All right, and this one, um, greetings from New York. I did this at the State Fair um, two summers ago, which was really cool. I have a bit of a partnership or a collaboration, if you will, with 4-H. I actually went to 4-H when I was a kid, um, so I like what 4-H does, and I've been working with them on creating curriculums to educate people um, about soil science through soil painting. Um, much more formally than what I'm doing here today. So this is the painting that I painted live at the New York State Fair. Um, it was a lot of people. I think we counted that I talked to 300 people while painting this. And that is a skill that I've learned with time. I used to not be able to uh, paint and talk. And then I also paint for myself. Um, this painting I call resilience. Resilience is a very important word in soil um, health and soil science. You know, you want to have a resilient system. We talk about resilience a lot. And I painted this for myself 
Um, I've had some offers, quite a few offers actually to buy it. And this is one I'm, I'm keeping. Um, just to remind me to stay strong, you know, like doing the, the full-time grad school, the full-time super high level management of this lab job. And then also the soil painting thing took off and I knew I was going to do something with soil painting, but honestly, I was planning on waiting until I graduated, but that's not how life goes. Right. And of course, upon reflection, this is the, you know, this was the way that it should have gone, but this painting I keep, um, you know, in a prominent place just to remind myself just to stay strong, be resilient and keep, keep on keeping on right and it's been especially good this past year which i know has been hard for all of us and during this past year i was um, inspired to paint this painting resistance again resistance is an important concept in soil science um, we're typically talking about compaction and resistance underground which can be a big issue in this case it's again a bit of a play on words and this was me showing my support for the Black Lives Matter movement and for the movement towards uh, racial justice in this country. Um, this is also one of the most graphic um, types of paintings I've ever done. I've never, um, I usually blend a little bit more and this is just two colors, um, but I'm very pleased with the way that this turned out. This one was very small. This was kind of a, oh, I think I'll just make a little painting. It's about six by six. It's just a little painting. And I did this for this dean that was retiring from Cornell this past year. And uh, some of my colleagues asked if I would contribute something to her gift basket. Um, I have posters and some magnets and stuff like that. And I could have done something like that. But I thought, you know, this woman, I really enjoyed her leadership while I've been working here. And I really want to give her something special. So I made this little apple for the teacher painting, which was fun, a little simple, but it was a fun project. All right, and then this is my most recent painting, um, still untitled. It might not, it might not get a name. I'm on the fence about that. Um, I really love this painting. This is really an example of where I'm about to go. I'm really interested in depicting skin colors with the literal skin of the earth. I just, I think that's really cool. And I think it's so cool that so many soil colors just are the same colors as various types of skin. Any type you can imagine, there's a soil color that looks like that. I really like that. And also this is where I started to blend colors and I started to work on blending on the actual canvas and also, I was able to start to get some level of detail <clears throat> that I hadn't been able to achieve in the past. It's really tricky to paint with a textured material, as you might imagine. Um, but I've, you know, I've obviously learned how to do it. But to get these kind of little black, you know, like her eyes and stuff like that, I messed around with these eyes for so long. And this painting, I actually worked on for like three years. This painting I started as something to do when I was teaching soil painting classes and I could kind of work on something if no one needed me so I wasn't like hanging over their shoulders or whatever. And then just, it was just right before the end of this year, you know, I decided, I was like, you know, I want to finish that painting. I kind of wanted to finish a bunch of stuff, like cross things off the list, you know. So I finished this and I'm really pleased with it and I'm really excited to see what I can do next because I can see um, a lot of options that I, I didn't know were, were possible with this as an art medium. So I did want to share um, one slide of a community painting. I told you guys, like I have these blank canvases and I let everyone just get really creative with it. Um, this one on the left hand side of the screen, this is an example from the Reggae Fest. Um, the funniest thing about this painting is that right at the end I left, as you can imagine, it kind of takes a lot out of you to do these events. And I went to like, go get some water. And I walked away for, I swear, 10 minutes. And I came back and this little girl had written, I love cats all over the canvas. I was so upset about it. But now I love this painting. I actually have it hanging in my guest room. And um, I'm not super into cats. They're fine or whatever. But I, you know, it just ended up being so hilarious that I just had to go with it and I had to share this example. And then also, um, I just wanted to mention, you can see it here on the screen. I actually have made public my methods for painting with soil. 
this is pretty unusual thing for an artist to do, but as a scientist, I thought it was important. And indeed, people have used my directions for painting with soil. They've been published in other ways, but also they've helped people all over the world have soil painting events of their own. Um, this is available on my website. And I've also included other various contact information on this slide as well as the information for the Cornell Soil Health Lab website in case any of you are more interested in that. Well, that's a wonderful encapsulation. Thank you, Kirsten, so much for sharing your passion for the subject, the science behind it, the creative journey that you've been on throughout all this time. And uh, we're looking forward to much more in the future. We know that's coming. So. I really appreciate you inviting me. I am a huge fan of the Trumansburg Conservatory of Fine Arts, and I really, I really want to be communicating to my community, you know, so thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Of course, of course, this was wonderful. And again, to remind those people who joined us a little bit later, um, this is the first of our series of lectures looking at the intersection of fine arts and science. Our next planned lecture will feature Dr. David Peck, and it will concentrate on honeybee communication through dance and parallels with human development in dance. And that will be happening on Sunday, February 21st at 6 p.m. Information will be available at the Trumansburg Conservatory website at tcfa.live. I hope you all join us.